Hello, folks, and welcome back to another episode of Canberra Conversations. And today's conversation, we are talking about why Bitcoin. Now, this is going to be uh, very much an entry level. So at this point, don't get too worried. We're going to guide you through that journey. And to do so, I'm joined by the gentleman behind Crypto Glasgow, Declan Kelly and Donald Cameron. Gents, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing, Colin? Hi, Colin. Thanks for having us. Delighted to have you on. And I think when it comes to speaking about so many of the subjects that we've covered so far in the podcast, I'm always looking to reach out to a range of different levels of guest and expert. And I want to bring things to the audience that is relatable and understandable as well as evidence-based. And hopefully I think we can tick that box tonight. So I think to, to start us off, guys, where did Crypto Glasgow come from and what kind of drove the, the reasons for starting it? So... Crypto Glasgow wise was just, there was that much uh, demand for, so we've been into crypto for years basically at this time and we always had people asking, you know, what is crypto? How do I get involved in crypto? Is crypto good? So we just constantly had like, on Instagram or our friends or our family were always asking us. So we've seen that there was that really big demand for like for education on crypto. Um, so that's where, that's where the, the idea of Crypto Glasgow came from anyway. How all yeah. started, I suppose, is, is quite different because it was a, a bit of a lockdown business, shall we say. Mm-hmm. Um, something we just decided to just go for it. Um, after kind of getting put, um, a lot of people asking for it, like Dick said, we want education, we want some knowledge. We had the education, we had the knowledge. We thought, well, let's help others now get that uh, and be the front of the kind of Glasgow's crypto scene, if you like. Yeah, this makes total sense. And it's certainly an area where... I'm lacking education and I'm sure many of the listeners as well will maybe heard the term, they'll maybe seen sensationalist news stories and tonight's really an opportunity for us to draw together some of the facts behind it as well as get an understanding of initially why we might even consider something like cryptocurrency when it maybe seems like a very foreign concept to some people listening who have traditionally grown up in, in the UK where most of the listeners are where we really think about pounds and pence and we think about uh, traditional banks and we think about our salary coming in monthly and in, in, in pound sterling and we haven't really thought too much about that many of the listeners in the podcast will hopefully have explored things like investments and uh, moving their money into different areas based on some of the discussions that we've had in the podcast previously but I guess my first question is what is one of the driving factors of us looking at an alternative to traditional money so to speak to kick off by um, the benefits of crypto and what crypto is, I suppose, and what yeah. I mean, obviously, you get the big name Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the main name when it comes to crypto. If there was no Bitcoin, there would be no crypto. Um, in terms of um, comparing it or why it's different to current traditional money or pounds and pence, whatever it may be, is it's de- really it comes down to decentralized and centralized. So, your centralized markets being just your general stock markets, your, your pounds and your pence owned by the government. But then you've got your Bitcoin and your crypto, which is decentralized. So it's not run by anyone in particular. It's essentially a computer. It's the world's smartest computer program that runs the whole technology behind it. No one can control that, which, again, is a big benefit because, as we know, with the current situation we're in, money's getting printed, people are losing their jobs. Everyone's just a bit all over the place because of a centralized network and who can control that network. Uh, Whereas, like I said... Uh, Bitcoin is less less controlled. Um, it's controlled by the people, shall we say, for the people. Yeah, this makes total sense. And I think one of the things you mentioned there is that the government and central guys, governments are printing money at a, a rate that we've never seen before when it comes yeah. to, and the, the term for that is quantitative easing. And I think a lot, maybe some listeners have heard that before, but for those who haven't, effectively the government is just adding zeros to the bank accounts. The furlough scheme doesn't pay for itself. The massive checks that are being handed out to different industries, which are being closed during the COVID period. This money hasn't just come from nowhere. Well, or effectively it has. I guess so. <laughs> it's, it's when you say it out loud, you're thinking, wait a minute. It's, you start to click and you realize it literally is coming from thin air. Yeah, Actually, so we, we, we pay our taxes and taxes have remained the same during this period, but millions and potentially billions of pounds as this continues have been created to support industries. But when that's happening, money is being devalued or p- the pound is being devalued and so is the dollar and other currencies. Yeah. Because in America, we know that um, 
under the Trump administration. Say what you want about about uh, the Donald, but he's print, he's print, he's printed and created more money in the last three years than uh, almost all the presidents before him. So trillions, it's trillions. It's, it's, it's even scarier when you come to the zeros on the trillion dollar compared to the billion dollar. So it's, and, and with all of that in mind, uh, Don, you mentioned there that crypto is a potential solution to that, given that it's decentralized and it's not related to the government in terms of how much of it is produced. Is that Would that be the best term to, to use? Yeah, to, to, to kind of home in on that, essentially what Bitcoin is, is a deflationary asset. And what that means is you can't create any more of what it, what's been produced. So there's 21 million has been programmed to ever be produced. Um, it'll take, I think we Googled it early, and it come up to about 2001, sorry. The year 2000. The year 2000, 2040. The year 2000, um, is when the last Bitcoin will be mined. So it's it's a select amount will only ever be created, whereas an inflationary asset like a, a pound or a euro or whatever it may be, is they can just print it for fun, as we've, as we've seen the past six months. Um, they just literally print the money it's for fun. An, an infinite amount of pounds or dollars or euros can be printed. So um, Bitcoin and most cryptocurrencies are limited supply, so there'll only ever be a limited supply, yeah. and that's it. So yeah. There's 21 million there. As soon as those 21 million are, are essentially mined or bought, um, that's it, they're done. So you need to then exchange them with other people. You can't mine them anymore. They're all, they're all gone. So, But with pounds, euros, there's, it's infinite. So that's why they're printing trillions and trillions. You can't print trillions of Bitcoin. It's 21 million, and that's you. That's it done. Yeah, I understand this. And I think when it comes to the quantitative easing and what's happening with our current traditional currencies, we're seeing that, and you've used the term uh, deflationary there, haven't you? Yeah. We are experiencing inflation levels, which we potentially have never seen before, maybe apart from in certain countries or kind of communist regimes, which have collapsed the, across yeah. the world where they've... Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Where they just so like a loaf of bread in Zimbabwe was costing like millions of whatever their currency was. <laughs> yeah. And in this country, if you look at the price of your food shop, it may not be jumping radically yet, but there yeah. are items that are, are jumping. And the classic example we always use is, is the Freddo, isn't it? When we were growing up as kids, we're 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 nineties kids, we remember the Freddo at 10, 15 pence. Now it's yeah. a pound. That is exactly what's happened with so many different Mm -hmm. items and resources which we are seeing and in real terms the money in our pocket and our salary is becoming less valuable versus what we can buy so our spending power is decreasing because yeah. more money is being generated so in stark contrast to that and in favor of cryptocurrency which again to clarify for the listeners i'm very much learning about at the moment rather than somebody that's as clued up as you guys or as big an advocate as you guys and Cryptocurrency doesn't have that challenge because, like you say, there's a finite supply, meaning that yeah. its value should hold against inflation. Yeah, and and that is a that's a big selling point, I suppose. It is. It's one of the main it's one of the main selling points, basically, that it is deflationary. So over time, that if the demand stays or the demand grows, the the price will grow. It's the same as gold, but there's a there's a limited supply of gold. You can't, once the gold's done, unless you, you go to a, a different planet, they're speaking of mining gold in other planets, but <laughs> on this planet, there's a there's a finite amount of gold, and once it's all mined, it's all mined, it's all gone. So um, it's been, you can basically just compare Bitcoin to gold, a digital yeah. version of gold, um, in the way that it's a limited supply. I think that's a huge point, and we've had conversations in the podcast before about gold, and we've got a couple of conversations coming up about gold as well. And it is, again, that deflationary asset, which, because there's a finite supply of it, in recent months, gold has just rocketed in value, hasn't it, in order yeah. to, in terms of versus the dollar and versus the pound, because there's a finite supply, and because we're printing more pounds, our pounds are buying less gold than ever before. Yeah. So yeah, it's exactly. uh, it's it's all they're both going in the same direction. Anyone watching on YouTube, yeah. I'm dancing about my hands here, but uh, <laughs> it's trying to trying trying to illustrate the point where we, real money, I said, uh, traditional money is going down in value, but deflationary assets like Bitcoin and gold are going up in value because of the basically the inverse effect of us printing more, but also exactly. this this other this other source or this store of value, so to speak. 
yeah, is yeah. remaining stable or at least only increasing in terms of number at a very small rate? Yeah, so basically with, with inflation, your purchasing power decreases. So basically if you just hold pounds or euros or dollars, every year guaranteed your purchasing power declines over every single year. So basically if you hold these kind of assets or currencies, you're guaranteed to lose money, or guaranteed to lose purchasing power yeah. over time. But over, I think since the dollar was created, it's lost at like 95% yeah. of its purchasing power. So, but you can you can see that here in Britain as well. It just happens so slow. It happens really fast in these kind of poor countries, Zimbabwe, Venezuela. But here it happens slower at a slower rate, only a few percent a year. But if you go back, you know, back kind of 40 years ago when a house was uh, 15,000, now it's 150,000. So that that's where you really you really see the, the the purchasing power decreasing when you when you look at those sort of things or when you look at the cost of a brand new car. Thirty years ago, it was like a thousand. Now yeah. it's twenty thousand. So people think that they've got the no, I've got ten pounds. Like it's ten pounds. It will always be ten pounds, and that's right. But that ten pounds loses purchasing power every single year. So the people. So it's basically just you don't get educated this in school. So nobody really knows. They just think that. A ten pound is a ten pound. It will always be ten pound. I get paid my wage. It, everything's fine. It is what it is. But if you look, if you if you just go back in history and you see the prices of what things were to now, to your your purchasing power decreasing, you really need to start. If you want to hedge against that, you need to look at other assets, be it deflationary assets, crypto, gold, art, yeah, maybe art. Yeah. Come on. This is this is you. This is huge, guys, and I think. Not to not to go on too much of a tangent. No, we laughed about it before the podcast. We don't want to go on tangents, but <laughs> for example, let's look at the money that footballers earn nowadays. Yeah. It's it's incredible, but actually, their purchasing power isn't as ridiculous as it might have been if they earned that money four years ago, five years ago, yeah. ten years ago. And to give a really close to home example, my 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 grandpa, as, as many listeners know, played for a Rangers football club in the nineteen forties, nineteen fifties, and his wage famously. Um, doubled from one pound a week to two pounds a week during the 1940s and he was considered one of the top football players at Rangers Football Club ever and when he when he was 18 19 years old he got a rise of one pound to two pounds a week and that was considered revolutionary in terms of the amount of money he was being paid at that age whereas nowadays your 18 19 year olds that are playing for Premier League football clubs in in England are on hundreds tens of thousands of pounds a week as a minimum so inflation has occurred in that space because the value of football has not really increased apart from through tv deals and even then that's that's questionable as well so that's just another very close to home example for myself and i you think you can look anywhere really and, and see inflation if all, all you need to do is go back in time and you'll see the the massive difference but so you can see it everywhere property cars um, football everywhere wages the price of people's wages over time if you go back to 30 years ago, 40 years ago, they're making pennies. So, and now it, it seems like you're making more, but well, that purchasing power wise, you're not. Even now, what they do as well with, with some salaries is you get a, a 2% increase. Maybe you have promotion, you get a 2 to 5% increase, but inflation can be 3 to 5, 6%. So, you feel like, oh, I'm getting a, a wage rise here, but actually, in the world of economics and actual real life situations, you're not making any more money. Exactly. You're, you're making exactly. the same money in the same job, if not a, a harder job to be able to purchase the exact same things you did the year before. Okay, so I think that's us given a really strong case as to why people are looking at deflationary assets like Bitcoin, like gold, and why they're considering those. And I guess today's conversation is going to be about how we address why Bitcoin in particular and what are some of the fundamentals behind it. So one of the things you mentioned was about mining and one of the kind of key terms when it comes to Bitcoin is the blockchain. So I guess, can you give us a bit of a a one-on-one entry level as to what that means for the listeners? Sure, yeah. So blockchain, for anyone who doesn't know what it is, it's it's, it's fairly new. It's cryptographic technology. It's I say it's fairly new. It's maybe 20, 30 years old, but it's new to us because Bitcoin is used on blockchain. Um, So Bitcoin's only 11 years old. Um, With with blockchain, a a quick kind of rundown how it works is, especially for, for, um, for Bitcoin anyway, is you, you get these rewards, like Bitcoin mining, as you say. So you, what happens, essentially, it's like, a, it's like a maths quiz to an extent. These miners, it takes about 10 minutes, roughly, to answer and go through all these, these cryptographic and mathematical questions. 
for doing that, their reward is part share of the, the Bitcoin. So what they're doing is they're helping build each block in the chain. It's a very, I don't know who named it, but it's very straightforward. It's literally, as it states, it's a chain of blocks. And each block holds information or, or data or whatever it may be. Transactions, probably a better way to put it. So any transaction that's made on the blockchain for, uh, for Bitcoin, for Ethereum, whatever it may be, is 100% transparent. Um, it's all 100% held on that and it cannot be erased. That's probably the most important part is anything that happens on the blockchain can never be edited. When it's done, it's done. Then anyone in the world can view it at any point. So it's, again, 100% full transparency. Um, it's probably the best way to explain blockchain, in all honesty. Um, it's used in other different types of markets and whatnot, but of course for crypto, it's all to do with the transactions and the security behind it. And that relates to, again, that finite ability to reach and access that 21 million Bitcoins that yeah. exist yeah. and the time that it takes to achieve that. So similar to gold, there's a, an investment of time or money potentially that needs to be invested to, in order yeah. to access that resource and to release yeah. that into the open market, so to speak. Exactly, yeah, exactly. It, basically the exact same. It's digital gold. You can think of the mining that way as well. You, you mine Bitcoin, you mine gold, you, you get the rewards for mining it. Yeah. So basically when you're mining it, you're processing transactions for the rest of the network and then you're getting rewarded for that. So it's basically, it's, it's just that ecosystem where people get, do their transactions, send money, and then if Don was to process that transaction on the blockchain, he gets a reward for that. So it keeps, it keeps the, all the money and rewards in the ecosystem rather than going through a third party, like if you were going through PayPal or whatever, it's all in the, all in the blockchain, all done through the miners and the participants that are using the technology. Okay. And how do, how do I, as the layperson, get access to buy cryptocurrency or Bitcoin? Because, for example, when I invest in my stocks and shares, ISA, I have a broker, Hargreaves Lansdowne, Vanguard, somebody of that ilk, and I know you've been yeah. involved in the stock market in previous years, in previous yeah. years, Dick, that you've talked to me about. How do I get access? So, so basically, so you can either mine it, like we says, which is um, processing transactions where you, you get a reward. So you can you don't need to buy it; you can just mine it, which is is we won't go into it too much. But it's basically really expensive now because yeah. just because of it, the that's the way it's programmed. It gets harder to mine over time. That's built into the, the protocol. But in terms of in terms of buying it, so you can either mine it or you can buy it. So you buy it the same way as a stock. You can buy it from an exchange. You download an app on your phone. You can buy it over the counter, which is you could buy it from like a broker, as you says. So it's basically it's near enough the exact same as stocks, um, where you can use a centralized party to buy that, which is on an exchange, or you can buy on a decentralized exchange, or you can swap it on a decentralized exchange, which uh, there is there's no third party there. But for us, we, we use both. Like we'll use a, a centralized place like the stockbroker. So we would go on their app or their website and then we just buy it there. We okay. send pounds and we get crypto in return. So it's just a, it's just an exchange. It's the same way as stocks, basically. It's, yeah. it's easy to compare it to stocks. It's, it's very similar. Okay, this makes sense to me. And is there a benefit to doing it from a decentralized perspective? Because one of the big things we've spoken about is that when we have crypto, it's not related to government or a third party, which is underpinning it. This is a decentralized thing that is based purely on the blockchain and the ecosystem around that. If you get a, a broker or a third party involved, does that take away from some, from some of that benefit? No, they just essentially act as the middleman. And they so, take a fee. Yeah, so I don't know, do you pay for your, your investment? Like, is it an app I'm guessing you've got? Do you pay yeah. a monthly fee? Or, yeah. yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll pay a brokerage fee to Hargreaves Lansdowne based on uh, an annual investment. And if I, if I wanted to wheel and deal and sell and buy yeah. uh, in, in, in volume, then there would be an additional charge. They would take a percentage. So I imagine it's the yeah. same in Bitcoin. It's the exact same. It's, it's not as common to do that, though. Um, that's kind of the whole point in crypto is to kind of manage your own money and be your own bank, essentially. Um, so yes, there is brokers and they will take a fee for it. Um, or you can literally just do it all by yourself. There's no fees involved. A lot of these exchanges, because they are um, decentralized, they don't have KYC. So you don't have to be given over your ID documents and whatnot. 
um, which again scares some people, but it also helps other people in the, the whole crypto industry buy and sell and trade more freely. So, yeah. There is some criticism, isn't there, around the safety of storage of crypto? Can you address that for the listeners? Yeah, so in terms of, so if, for instance, if you were to go buy now, what, you downloaded the app, you were going to buy it, so you can store it in that app. So that means that that centralized party is holding your crypto. So it's, it's your crypto, but it technically isn't in your possession. It's in the third party's possession. The same way your, your stockbroker will kind of be in custody of your stocks for you. So it can work like that. But once you've, so if you went and bought tonight, once you, once you receive them, you can send them to your own wallet, which is just like a, a USB drive. So you send it from the app to your wallet it's off the app, it's, it's finished, and now it's in your, your own personal wallet. So you're in full 100% control of that. You can take it the other, the other side of the world. You can, you can do anything with it. You're free, basically. If you were to try and take, I don't know, like a, a large amount of cash or a large amount of gold to another country, you, you, you get stopped at borders and they say, what's this? Why, why have you got it? Yeah. What are you doing with it? Yeah. But you could hold well, unlimited money in this, in this USB drive. And that's it's fully stored in there so you can either store it a lot of people like storing it on the exchange because it's easy and it's fast yeah. and they don't really trust themselves to look after their own money because you could lose your wallet and you could lose all your money so basically you can store it yourself or on an exchange it's basically preference um and also the, the exchanges are a bit like stocks are they're insured they can be hacked if you, if you hold your own personal money it can't be hacked because it's, it's offline essentially, it's on your USB. But if you if you hold it with a centralized party, they can be hacked. Yeah, of course so they can. That, that's the kind of the options to weigh up. But the like stocks, they're insured as well. And on most cases, they kind of reimburse the, the, the hacked funds that are held on a centralized exchange. So it's it's kind of preference really. This makes sense. And I, I think when it comes to that moving it out of the app and away from the the broker and the third party to holding it yourself that's where crypto probably sets itself apart from mm-hmm. other things and that then becomes your risk and your own liability i suppose like you say you obviously you could lose that usb drive you and i believe there's a there's a there's a number what's the what's the term for passwords i'm, I'm sure i've i've heard you talk about this before um, your speed phrases yeah. yes yeah talk yeah. me through yeah. that guys yeah they call it your keys um, okay. it's, it's, when we call it a USB drive, just to kind of add a little bit to that, it's a, an encrypted, it really is like a USB stick, but it's the world's most secure USB stick, I guess, and it's encrypted so that literally no one can hack this little little stick. Um, for instance, the new versions, you can actually have a Bluetooth connection to your phone as well. So even though it's offline and it's stored on this physical hardware wallet, you can still keep track of it on, your, on an app on your phone. Okay. So it's, it kind of beats, it's the best of both worlds, I guess. It's offline secure, but you know 100% what's going on with your funds and your investments. Okay. What would I need a seed phrase for then in order to access it? Yeah. So like your, your path is essentially just a yeah. password, but it's, it's 14 words rather than a password. So, so it's basically impossible to try and guess because it's 14 words. Yeah. yeah. So it's just, it's just for added safety. And then you've got a password as well. You've got a seed phrase. It's just to be, it's, crypto is just, all it is is just safety and to not be hacked, to not lose it. It's just, it focuses on safety, basically, protecting your money. Yeah. So that you can't be hacked, so you can't, it can't be stole, stuff like that. So, so that's, some, some of the headlines that we've seen in the press are fairly sensational then because they do talk about crypto hack and crypto leak, but that's yeah. them hacking from a third party that holds yeah. for yeah. people. And like you say, similar to a bank. So if my Bank of Scotland account was hacked and uh, attacked or or the bank went bust, then they have insurance up to, I think, £85,000 for, yeah. uh, for your kind of general cash bank. And I imagine there's a similar scheme in place as you've highlighted for crypto in terms of third parties that hold that. Mm-hmm. Some exchanges will cover you. The, the bigger exchanges will cover you. It's again, this is where the education comes into it. And that's what we're, we're trying to push. It's because... Yes, there's loads of different exchanges and there's so many different ways of getting involved, but which one's the right one to, to go through? Where's the most security? Where's, where's the safest option, essentially? Yeah, 
one of the hardest questions that I've got for you tonight, gents, is could crypto become illegal to transact with in Bitcoin or could it become illegal to transact? Because I guess my reason for that question is we've got the precedent of another deflationary asset, gold, became illegal um, for people in the US to hold between 1933 and 1974. It's well documented. I'm, I'm, you guys, I won't be, won't be teaching anything new to here. But when that became illegal because the government was worried about people putting all their money into gold and deep or, and not investing in their dollar and their currency, mm-hmm. is there a risk that that goes the same way for Bitcoin and crypto in your opinion? Um, well, the, obviously there is a risk we're open to. The risk, it's a, it's a new asset, well, it's 10, 11 year old, but it's a relatively new asset. So we're not saying it's it's 100% going to work. It's 100%, like we're open, we're, we're open, we know that, the, the dollar can fail, but anything can yeah, fail. we know the pros and cons. We know, we know the pros and cons. Yeah. So basically, th- there is a few countries that have banned it, like um, Afghanistan, one, uh, Bangladesh, like yeah. kind of smaller, poorer countries that are afraid that if everybody turns to this, then they lose the control of the people via their own currency. Yeah. So it, it's happened in small, kind of poor countries. But if, for instance, um, well, um, the US were to ban crypto, just say crypto is banned in general. Um, they can't really enforce it because it's decentralized. So I could, if I was in the US, I could still send you money. I could still transact worldwide because they, they haven't got any control or power over the, the network. So it's fully decentralized. But they can say it's banned if you get caught using it, you, you get a fine, you get the jail, whatever. Um, but the, the thing with doing that is, if, if America was to ban it, then they, they then basically set themselves back. This is, this is a brand new technology that's, that's it's a brand new industry. So if they were to ban it, they'll just stifle their own innovation, basically. Yeah, they'll fall behind. They'll fall behind, and then the UK will excel, and China, <laughs> China will yeah. excel. So basically, if there's a, one of the kind of main cryptocurrencies just now, um, they've come out and says that, where the regulations that have been unfairly put on them, that they'll, they'll be happy to take their business to another country that's more crypto friendly if the US like, proceeds with the regulations that they're saying they're going to do. They, they're happy to cooperate, but they just feel it's unfair, unfair regulations. So if they were to then move to another country, then they could pay that country tax, they could, they could build the company there. So you be, it, in short, if you were to ban it, you basically shoot yourself in the foot because that's the way that technology is going. It's the way money is going. So it, it wouldn't be in their best interest to ban it. They can regulate it, but not ban it as such. I think to pull apart a couple of things that you said there, first of all, like any investment or asset, there's a risk involved and you acknowledge that. And I think that's so important to, to get that out there because, again, one of the recent episodes was on Forex and the guys that are online talking about that talk about it as if, you're, you're shooting fish in a barrel in terms of the money you can make, whereas you're fully aware that, yep, you can invest in this. It's an asset. It's a deflationary asset. But, of course, there's a risk that things change and technology evolves. However, your justification and the belief that you've given yourself and the reassurance that you have from your research and understanding is that countries would be looking backwards and being a bit adverse to their long-term prospects should they not allow cryptocurrency to continue in its, uh, in, its, in its current form and to expand. So I think that gives some reassurance to people about where your thought process on it comes from rather than yeah. an element of blind faith. Yeah, just to say, it'd be like, just for example, it would be like, take the UK 20 years ago saying, right, we're banning the internet because crypto is just a technology. That's what it is. It's, it's a currency, but the, the main thing is it's a technology. So that's like the UK saying 20 years ago, we're banning the internet. And if the UK banned the internet, then basically none of these businesses would exist that they exist just now. So you can you can kind of relate it to would would a country ban the internet? And some some regulate the internet, like China, you can't see stuff, but they don't ban it because it's that's just the way the world's going. And if you ban it, then you're left behind, basically. Yeah. I think the next thing that I think is important for us to cover is around the sheer scale of the price increase in the last 11 years of Bitcoin's history. What's what's been going on there and 
what is your understanding of that and where do you think it's going to go? And equally, I've got a couple of questions around maybe whether it's peaked or whether it's where it's going to go and, 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 and around that. Yeah, so I guess the, the most famous time Bitcoin was, what everyone started to know about it was December 2017. When it hit the 20k mark and everyone just went bonkers, like, what is this project? What is this? What is this money? So the way it works, I mean, even back then, it was a lot of it was based on speculation. So this might happen or this company might use Bitcoin, whatever it may be. And you got a thing called FOMO, obviously the fear of missing out, we all know what that is. So that's massive when it comes to crypto because of what happened. It went from it was two or three thousand dollars to twenty thousand dollars in eighteen days. And you know, so it, it is insane to, to look at these numbers, but the way Bitcoin actually works is these things called the, the Bitcoin having. So essentially what happens every four years is the block reward, as we spoke about previously, gets halved by 50%, um, which means that there's less supply, which causes, even if the demand stays the same, the supply is cut in half by 50%. Therefore, simple supply and demand economics, the, the price goes up. So that's, that's the main kind of benefit and, and bonus behind it. Then you've got the reason for people wanting to use it for its decentralized nature, um, for what it's actually created in terms of, is it a currency? Can it be used as a currency? Or, yep. for instance, a company like Ripple or Ethereum, these other type of altcoins, which is an alternative to Bitcoin, they think they can move it a bit better and, and whatnot. So it's, it's all to do with how much you're willing to pay for that asset, I guess, depending on the, the, the demand and the supply. It's, again, simple supply and demand uh, economics. In that sense, it's the same as any other asset. So it's the same as stocks and shares. So we're speculating yeah. that, right. uh, that Apple is going to be worth more next year. Yeah, now, exactly. we, might, we might be quite confident that it is going to be worth more, but we don't know by how much more it's going to be worth, yeah. particularly yeah. given that some stocks can be incredibly overpriced. So one of the most famous examples is a lot of people thought Snapchat was going to go through the roof. Yeah. But what yeah. happened, Instagram stories came oh. about and Snapchat <laughs> just completely died in its arse and now it's used by 14-year-olds and strange men who are trying to solicit young ladies. <laughs> so exactly. so, so that's, that, that is a good example of why price fluctuates in terms of we're speculating on it going up when it when it peaked so far at its most at 20,000 per bitcoin in 2017 yeah. it's yeah. never reached that height again is there a is there a belief in some areas that that will never get back to 20,000 or is there a belief that that's going to get there because where's it at just now it's 12 well it's 11 it, it could be 12 now it was 11 9 today um, that's dollars as well. That's, yeah, we, okay. um, we speak in dollars a lot in crypto because it's the global reserve currency that's the main currency. So, like the figures we speak in are mostly dollars. So right now it's twenty, th it's twelve thousand dollars, and the peak was twenty thousand dollars. So they kind of the, the price predictions ran up to well, a million dollars per Bitcoin, like long term, because over time the, the same way well, it used to be two cent. And it went to twenty thousand, so there's thousands of percent increase. And especially with all this quantitative easing of money printing, the more money they print, the the, the more the, the price will go up because it's a limited asset. So um, we do we 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 see it. It it can hit twenty thousand this year again. It, they have bull markets and bear markets where the market goes up for a year, two years, and then they come down. It's just a correction. So over time. The price went from say two dollars to twenty dollars, and then come back down over a year, and then it will go back up again, and then back down. That just that's just the way any other stock works. Yeah. Apple, whatever, the, the prices go up and down. So uh, um, we we do see it going, obviously surpassing twenty thousand again. Whenever that may be, that that may be next year. It could be next week. That's the thing with crypto; they, they can happen so fast. So in terms of price here, we, it should definitely hit 20,000 again. Now, the supply and demand element of it is is the important part because from my understanding, 50% of crypto has never changed hands in the last five years. So somebody bought it five years ago, pre-2017. They saw it go rocketing up to 20,000, but they held, they didn't sell. No. Because one of, the, one of the things that meant it went from 20 down to 6,000 and to its kind of lowest in recent years 6,000 and it started to climb again was because a lot of people when it was at 20 just started bailing on it and I yeah. think maybe anyone that's watched the Wolf of Wall Street when they saw what they did with the the shares for uh 
what was it, Steve Madden shoes, where they inflated the price and then yeah. they were all holding them. And then as soon as it started to sell, they unloaded them. And then the people that had bought in had bought in at a really high price, but it was worth a lot less. So yeah. people that had bought in at 20,000 in December 2017, they saw it crash and it's not reached that level again. Yeah. However, 50% of people that were holding it at that point have still not sold and they're still sitting on it. Why yeah. do you think that is? It, it encourages saving. This is the thing. So because of what happened in December or, or 2017 in general, people have seen it go from $2,000 or $20, whatever it may have been, to $20,000. And it, I know it's fluctuated up and down and, and since then, but it gives that same sense of, oh, hang on a minute, if I hold on to this for long enough, it's already proven itself many times before that it rises to a peak of whatever it may be. Yeah. Yes, it will come back down, but that's how market cycles work. It's just market cycle. cycle is in anything. Um, so that it does actually fill you with the confidence to hold on as long as possible, hence why no one's moving their money. Yeah. What would you say to accusations that it might be seen as a pyramid scheme in terms of getting people to buy in now? So obviously you guys are sitting on your your crypto and you're you're happy with what you've got at the moment. You hope yeah. the value goes up. So obviously if there's a big spike in people buying it and your value goes up and up and up, then you could potentially pull out and get a lot more money back. Yeah. But again, like I say, there's obviously that precedent that a lot of people have never done that. But equally that's not to say that if you jet like let's say a thousand people that listen to this all buy into crypto, then obviously there'll be a wee spike in crypto, won't there? So yeah, people, yeah. Or, people if it was Bitcoin, yeah, not so much Bitcoin because it's too valuable. Uh, there's, there's a lot of money invested in it. Like the, the market cap's like 350 billion, so it would take a lot of money to move it. Yeah. So in terms of like pyramid scheme, well, it's definitely it's, with pyramid schemes, you make money from it. So essentially, if it was a pyramid scheme, I would be like, right, call, you should definitely buy some. You really need to buy some because I'm going to benefit from you buying some. I, I would get money. That's not how it works. Um, Bitcoin's actually the opposite of a pyramid scheme. Um, I wouldn't benefit, no one would benefit from you buying it. Directly, right? If anything, the, the way people look at it as well, when people try and pump the price, they say it's, if you look at it this way, if, if you're invested your money, you've done the, the research, you, you're educated enough, you're happy to make that 10 grand deposit, whatever it may be, the money you're putting in, that's your hard end money. Say it was Tesla, for instance, you put 10,000 into Tesla. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, you want it to go up. That's the whole point. And if you're an investor, you're in investments because you want to gain wealth, don't you? That's the whole point in it. So you're going to you're going to sing from the hilltops how great mm -hmm. it is if you believe in it. And the whole kind of exit or whatever it may be is you're not exiting to, to scam anyone or to make money from anyone. You're taking out because you've just invested your life savings in it. Your life savings have just went up 1,000%. You're not going to be like, I better not take that in case people get upset. You're going to take it and run to Marbella and buy a villa, aren't you? Like it's that's that's the thing. It's yeah. it's a free market. Yes, it's a free market. So you can see that by any investment. Mm -hmm. If you're told yeah. to buy Apple stock and it goes exactly. up, you take it out. It's so exactly. yeah, so it's exactly the opposite of a pyramid scheme, if anything. But in, ter can, in terms of like oh, on you both, on you both, mate. It, it, that can happen in any space, as you say, and I think that's really important, Dick, before we get to your point that equally that could happen with stocks and shares i gave the example from the wolf of wall street where they inflated the price of a certain stock yeah. and they crashed it and then like you say there was maybe a, a, some individuals that bailed out in 2017 when it peaked and that's yeah. part of the reason that it went down so severely but equally the long-term hope is that it goes on an upward trajectory obviously there'll be readjustments year to year yeah. but it goes up it goes up over the longer term as yeah. our purchasing power through traditional means decreases so, so yeah. on you go dick no, so well, to, to come back on that, so over time, the, the prices went up over the past 11 years before like, coronavirus, the prices went up just because over time, supply and demand, the, the prices steadily went up. If you look at, look at an all-time chart of Bitcoin, it basically has just been going up for the last 11 years, obviously down in between that, but the overall, overall trajectory is up, yep. and that's simply because of the way it is, it's supply and demand, it's limited. So a thing that's happened in between it, we've, we've always kind of had the, the, we never believed in the financial system before coronavirus, before they started injecting trillions into the economy. Yeah. So we've always been kind of hedging against that before COVID. And then it's basically just been accelerated by trillions in, in, in that such short period of time. So let's say for instance our targets were bitcoin for 100k before we knew coronavirus with the pandemic and all the printing we were still expecting 100k before this 
You see yeah. now that like injecting trillions, like the it's basically Bitcoin yeah. can go to a million, it can go to anything because the reason is because the dollar is infinite. So the more they print, the more they put into supply, the higher the price will go. So it's basically it'll, it'll go on. If the dollar goes on an un, another hundred years, the price of Bitcoin will just keep going up to another hundred years because it, it's just the simple supply in, and yeah. the economics. There's an inverse relationship between the two, and that they they yeah. go in contrasting to each other. And I guess that again, that's potentially where the risk comes from in terms of the US being unhappy with that and and trying to mm-hmm. to legislate against it. But equally, there's the there's the disincentive to do that in terms of holding themselves back and yeah. I, I think i think i think we've addressed that point around the, the pyramid scheme there and and whether it is a is a risk in that sense because like any investment your hope is that it goes up over the long term and you might yeah. you might sell a portion of it but you're likely to yeah. to stay in apart from that in terms of the deregulated nature of it one example i've got that's not always a benefit of that is where you have what we call an ico an initial coin offering and yeah. That raises a lot of capital at once. Again, similar in the, in, the, in, the, in the stock market, you can float and have an IPO, an initial public offering. Yeah. But there's been some crazy examples within cryptocurrency, hasn't there? The one that springs to mind for me is the Coinye, which was uh, named after Kanye West, where I think there was something like $14, $15 million that just got pumped into it. And then that, that coin just came out of circulation. They stopped mining it and it became worthless. Yeah. Is that the risk with people who maybe get caught up in the hype of, maybe sticking it to the man in terms of this is a decentralized thing. It's not regulated. I can have my money in a, in a different place. What is that the risk where you've got a deregulated industry that people don't quite understand they, the safety of it? They are, they are still regulated though. Crypto is still regulated, but um, do you want to uh, touch on the ICOs? The ICOs, is, ICOs are such a big thing. And why are such a big thing is because that's what sparked the 2017 bull run. And that's what, that's what get involved, everyone involved. So, when people say ICOs, I mean, don't get me wrong, there is, there are, sorry, there was some scams. It's a new market. People know it's current. There's loads of money getting pumped into it. If you're a scam artist, you're going to go to that market. It's, yeah. it's, that's a way of life for some people, unfortunately. But the way the ICOs worked is they weren't always a, a scam, per se. What happened was they, they've got the white paper, so they've got their plans, and over the next 12 months, we plan on raising these funds to then release this project or whatever it may be. What can happen to, and not even just in crypto, any, any market or any new startup is you've got all these plans for the future, but they might not get the funding that they want. Or for instance, they might find a bug. Quite recently, there was one where it raised something crazy, like it was like a million dollars per hour, something ridiculous. Yeah. But the next day they found a bug in the system. Therefore, people lose interest, withdraw their money, the price falls, and, the, and it looks like a scam. It wasn't a scam, it just... They found a bug, and these things can happen in anything. Um, but yeah, there, there was definitely back in the 2016, early 2017 days, there definitely was ICO scams. Um, you hardly really get ICOs nowadays, though, to be fair. A lot of these projects are projects that started back then and have managed to stay afloat until now. So um, it's because there's, there's startups essentially. So, yeah, any startups like I think it's like 60% of startups fail. So across any industry, they fail. So it's, it's the same in crypto. Like 90, 95, 99% of cryptos over time will fail because the only the, the strong will survive. It's a free market, the same yes. as everything else. Only the, the strongest, the best projects will survive. And that's why basically we, we say you need to educate. You don't just buy any hype. That's why, because you can lose all your money. The same way if you yeah. bought into a... I don't know, some oil company, this new oil company, you bought into them and then they do the same. They, they exit scam. They say they've got this promise of drilling and finding oil, but they don't. And then they've raised all this capital. So it's basically just, it comes down to education. Don't throw your, we say, do your own research. You really need to research these things first before you invest any of your money into it because that's what can happen. You can lose all your money, the same in, in every other market. So that's where, that's where we we like to come in with education and you need, really need to educate before you kind of purchase anything. Yeah, it, it's such a common theme throughout the podcast when it comes to any decision that we make that's important in our lives. And financially, that can be one of the most important decisions because long term, yeah. we all want to be in a position where we're, we're comfortable, we can look after ourselves, our family, whoever we care about. And that education piece is where the, the Instagram page for you guys is is, is, is really started to, to take off because you are providing that kind of 
straight up, straight talking facts around it, as well as sharing from your experience perspective. So I think that's, that's really valuable. One of the other challenges that I, I guess I can throw at you is around the structural problems. And I know technology is developing at a phenomenal rate when it comes to supporting Bitcoin. But my understanding is if, for example, we went to Bitcoin tomorrow, for example, in terms of our electrical, uh, our, our, our currency, we don't actually produce enough electricity to do that. I think at the moment, the current supply needs roughly the same amount as Visa. And Visa obviously does a considerably bigger number of transactions. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a concern that as we hopefully move towards more people um, and moving into the crypto space that we don't have the technology and the power to, to handle that? Not at all. Um, the big thing with, with crypto is we, we're aware, I say we as if I own crypto, but the crypto kind of um, space. space knows of, that's what people could come at crypto for because it's all electric and whatnot, but most of it's actually renewable energy. So it's, it's actually, we're benefiting, we're helping the, the world essentially. Yes, we're using a lot of power. Um, however, to help that, to combat that, we're also using renewable energy. Sort of it's most a lot of these a lot of these mining sites of the electricity is produced and uh, there's one in New York I can't quite remember where it is but it's 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 based off the fact that this other thing's producing energy it's not really getting used let's put it towards Bitcoin so it's yeah. yes it uses a lot of energy however we've combated that by using renewable sources and looking to to make it a greener um, kind of way of, of mining essentially and also as well like we we wouldn't really expect Bitcoin to just be the the number one currency and at a full switch over and pounds are away and dollars are away. Like they, they might stay, they could stay well, for the next, I don't know how, how many years, well, the dollar's been a hundred years and currencies don't usually last much longer than a hundred years. So it's kind of coming to the end basically. But even if it does stay, like they, they can both be there. Like it's not Bitcoin needs to succeed, yeah. the dollar needs to succeed. It's both of them. So um, in terms of that, like, all currencies can exist at the same time and um, they can both, well, they can thrive basically. Well, I wouldn't say the dollar can thrive, but uh, <laughs> it can exist. Can thrive. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I think, I think like you say, there's the, there's the hope that as time progresses and the dollar declines and the traditional currencies decline, that the technology and the power that we have available to manage a system the size of bitcoin in terms of the capacity it requires will hopefully yeah. increase because at the moment in from from what i understand in my research if we switched over or increased even a, a fairly significant amount in terms of bitcoin it would almost crash initially because of the the sheer size of the demand in terms of electricity and power so that makes total sense to me one of the one of the other questions i had is we're speaking about it maybe transitioning towards being our currency. Do you actually envisage it becoming something that we use to buy our shopping with, our cars with, our property with? Yeah, well, it's it possible. That it's, all, it's already happening just now, like not directly, but we've got crypto cards that we use that our crypto's on and that we make purchases with. So it's already happening just now. Um, so it's, it's happening already. And like Bitcoin's number six currency in the world just now. Okay. Um, it it's rises every year, so we don't really. It, it can be in the top three currencies worldwide, or it could be the number one currency worldwide. As I say, that doesn't mean that the dollar needs to die or the pound needs to die. They'll still be there. They just won't be the the main number one currency. But in terms of buying stuff, that that happens now. You can buy online with crypto. You can buy with your card. So it's already happening. And you, you asked as well about kind of exiting crypto. So I spoke with you a call a few months ago when I was selling a, a property and I was telling you that, that when I received the cash that I'll be moving that cash instantly to crypto, to gold, getting away from that cash. So if we were to, you call it exit, so we, we would call it like taking profit. So if we were to take profit out, it would be to put into a, an asset that would, that would increase in value over time. We, we would never take money out and hold cash because as we spoke about earlier your purchasing power decreases every single year guaranteed 100 percent guaranteed so we'd never exit to hold cash ever um so I, I don't know if that answers it i think that does answer my question to a large extent so one of the things that you've you've said there effectively is say you for example we did see a huge rise in bitcoin and you you didn't exit fully but you took out your profit that mm -hmm. money 
which would obviously it would have to come out as traditional money, I suppose. Well, that well, would be- it, it, well, I could. So, for instance, if we made a certain amount, say a hundred thousand, we made that. We can. So we wouldn't take out a hundred thousand and store it in a bank, a traditional bank. We could buy art with that hundred thousand. Yeah. We could buy jewellery. We could buy gold. We could buy yeah. stocks, property. We would never, we would never store cash. It's it, you're always guaranteed to lose money. It would, it would be, it, yeah. it would be a terrible decision, basically. There's also a thing as well when we say about taking profits is there is a a, a stable coin, what's called uh, in, mm-hmm. in, in crypto, which is pegged to the US dollar. So say for instance we did take 100 grand in profits, rather than taking it out and, and paying tax on it and withdrawing it to physical cash or your bank account, you can hold it in this thing which is called Tether, which essentially is a digital dollar, almost like a digital dollar to an extent, where it won't fluctuate too much, it's pretty much steady, and then if we're ready to then buy back in to, or to invest more money back into crypto, or whatever it may be, because we can still send that money to external websites, or you can, see because it's all based online, you, yeah, you don't really need to realise it, and you don't really need to see the physical cash or the physical mm-hmm. numbers on your on your RBS app or whatever, because you've got the something similar, but it's crypto based. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, I understand you move that. that money anywhere basically. Yeah, yeah. Is is that is that one of the main reasons that you're you're and you've spoken there about when you sold your property deck, the money went into crypto and into gold. So you chose two deflationary assets. Mm-hmm. Is there a particular reason that you favour as a percentage towards crypto over gold? Is it is it the online nature of it? Um, yeah, well, so it, to back, so there's there's a crypto that's backed by gold that you can that you can buy. But for instance, if you are just buying gold, you need to buy it physically. So yeah. it's it's basically just it's it's expensive to it's expensive to to hold to hold and store aye, it. to store safes so and whatnot. Aye, yeah, safes. And also, if you wanted to kind of, it's it's not very divisible. Like you can't split it up. If you wanted that, if you wanted to try and liquidate some of it, you can't. You need to, if you bought a bar of gold, you need to sell the full bar. You can't yeah. like, shave a bit off and sell it that way. So, basically, we we like gold, but in terms of if you you match it up with crypto, it's it's um, crypto is the better option because I could buy crypto now and I could sell it in thirty seconds. I could sell it tomorrow. I could sell a small portion. I could sell a big portion. But with gold, you it's hard to sell. You would need to post it insured. It's just we do like gold because it's it's a real physical. Yeah, it's real. But in terms of matching it with crypto, we we would lean towards crypto just yeah. because it's yeah. easier and it's faster, safer. Everything's kind of better than crypto. <laughs> Even from a, a perspective of an investor, when you, just, when you just break it down to the raw numbers, for instance, even just this year, just for, for talking sake, gold has risen 20-25%, which is really good. It's a really good year for gold, but crypto, sorry, Bitcoin itself, crypto in general, but Bitcoin itself has raised over 50% yeah. just yeah. this year alone. So it's from during a pandemic. pandemic. Exactly. So during a, the worst pandemic we've seen, it's still managing to rise. I mean, at the start of lockdown, it was $3,800. And it's now what twelve thousand dollars in a, a couple of months period. So that's another point of it as well. Is the storage is quite difficult. The moving it around is difficult. You can't travel with it. Go back to our little kind of USB stick. We can take that anywhere in the world, no questions asked. Whereas if you've got the equivalent to what's in, in Bitcoin and gold, you're going to need a, a trailer full of gold. Yeah, so it's, security. <laughs> it, it, yeah, security as well. Yeah, of course. So that's another kind of point of view of it. It's an investment piece in terms of the the. The gold is one of a store of value, it increases small parts over time, whereas crypto is another, it's looked at as a store of value, especially Bitcoin, but it increases exponentially over the years or over the months by hundreds, thousands of percent. Because it's so early as well, there's like in terms of worldwide the amount of people that are actually in it. So over time, the, the demand's only going to keep growing and the supply is only going to keep lessening. So it's, it's just the perfect recipe for for upwards price action yeah. basically as long as it as long as it the network stays with well, over the, its 11 years the network is is what's the the, the best compute network ever the safest yeah. compute network ever um so it's it's stood the test of time anyway in terms of it's never been hacked it's it's never failed so um so we we get a lot of confidence from that from time 
Like this isn't like three months, it's 11 years yeah. it's been here yeah. and succeeded. So that's where we get a lot of our confidence from. Yeah, I, 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 can, I can understand all of this. And I guess one of the final questions that I've got for you with respect to it is we've talked about exiting in terms of, prop, in terms of uh, pulling your profits out and doing that. Is there a time that you foresee when you would completely withdraw from crypto altogether and move to another asset class? And Never. if so, why? Well, the, obviously, it would depend if, uh, if something catastrophic yeah. happened or whatever. Um, but as it stands now, there, there'd be no reason to because crypto is faster, safer. The, any comparable, it's crypto is, the is, is better. So yeah. you, can, you can just do a, a, a search against like, stocks, against gold, anything. And crypto ticks more boxes than, than all the other assets just because of the way it's programmed. So... Like when we first got into it, it was to make cash, make pounds and exit and spend the pounds, enjoy the pounds, invest the pounds. But over time, when we learn about it and now we know what it is, now we understand it, we realise that that's where you want to be. That's where you want to store your value. So we, we would exit into other investments, small portions, but we would always, as it stands now, we would always want to be in crypto. But obviously... Things change. It, things change. External things can happen. We, we, we understand the risks. We're not kind of blind. No, it's, it's, it's going to succeed. Like, no, there's no certainties in life. So we understand that. The way, the way we look at it is it's creating generational wealth as well. So as we spoke about two or three times of the whole the blockchain having and the rewards having and whatnot, but the demand's still there. Deflationary products and assets only ever get better over time and it's been proven time and time again. So why would you want to exit something that's been proven over the past 11 years to increase in value year in, year mm -hmm. out to move it into something else? So you could do like gold or whatever to just to store that value that we put time and in to diversify. But realistically, personally for, for me and for DEC as well, I can speak for DEC is we'll always have a set amount of crypto, say, or a set amount of Bitcoin that we'll keep for generational wealth to pass down to our kids and whatnot. But there will also be a portion that we've got allocated that's, money that's we're happy for it to go up and take profits out of and spend them on cars houses watches whatever, whatever it may be at the time yeah, but, yeah over over the long term term we don't, we don't ever want to kind of i understand that so i think one of the things to pull from that is that when it does become profitable as long as you're not able to buy everything with crypto then you will need to take out and have some traditional cash yeah. to then make a purchase or an asset a purchase yeah. of an asset and then that diversifies your portfolio again or it purchases the item that you need but ultimately the va like everything you've got as much as possible is going to be within assets like gold but, and crypto yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but you don't you don't need to to exit into cash to to buy these things so like yeah. for instance like that this year we don't need to exit into cash like there's there's no reason we don't need cash like anything we can buy we can buy online which is with a crypto card or if we're out in a shop we can buy it with a crypto card so basically it's already happening that we don't need to go back to cash i couldn't even think off the top of my head what we would need cash for um so in terms of exiting we we don't need to go into these other the the, the traditional financial system we don't need to do that because we can move up we can buy stuff with our crypto. It's because it's all online. Anything you can buy online, you can buy with crypto. Really? So if I jump onto Amazon and you've got your, what's the card called, Deck? The, the, the there's there's always many. Essentially, it's so new. There's one, one we speak about quite often on our on Instagram is a company called Plutus. So it's a DeFi. So what that is is decentralized. So you're essentially like, you are your own bank. So mm -hmm. all the money, you can load money onto that, but you can also load crypto onto that as well. And it's a Visa debit. It's Visa. It's provided by the company Visa. You can go into any store and you can spend on it. The other benefit of that is one, you're spending your crypto. Uh, secondly, you actually get bonus or benefits, should we say, is yeah. up to like six percent in cash back and stuff. So it's I say cash back, crypto back. Yeah. So you you can go and spend and you can spend in pounds, obviously, because everyone accepts pounds. But it's taken from your crypto balance, transferred into the pounds. For the for the for the third party to, to take that money, but then you're rewarded for using this company's card, and they'll give you up to six percent, three percent, whatever it may be, back in in crypto. That's an incredibly interesting note for us to wrap up on, gents. Because for me, that's an education piece that 
uh, there was a lot of stuff that I wasn't aware of that we've, we've chatted about, but equally the fact that at the moment there is still the opportunity to spend your crypto without converting it back into cash yeah. is a big benefit to holding more of your assets in a, or holding more of your wealth in a deflationary asset that we've spoken about. Yeah. One of the key things we've spoken about throughout tonight's episode is education, and that's what you've been aiming to do through your Instagram platform and some of the resources that you've created. Where is yep. the best place for people to find you and connect with you guys? So if you get his Instagram's our main port of, of call, should we say, so it's just at crypto.glasgow. Uh, the company is, we are at hand a consultancy, so we're a crypto consultancy, um, but our, our handle is crypto.glasgow. Um, and it's, it's, it's solely based on, on Instagram. We do, of course, offer consultations and whatnot too over the phone, which can be booked via the website. Uh, but yeah, everything that you need to get in contact with us to find any of our information is, is on our, our Instagram page. Fantastic. So that'll be linked in the show notes below. A massive thank you to Deck and Don for coming on the podcast this evening. If you've enjoyed it and you're with us at this point, please take a screenshot, pop it in your Instagram story. There's going to be so many questions coming off the back of this one. And I can't wait to hear your feedback as we continue to explore a range of different topics. And I'll be back to speak to you all again very, very soon.